it's working. Try. Hello. Yeah. Testing. Yeah. Working. Yeah. Everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. So just to say, uh, now we have a final workshop of the day. API design lifecycle. Actually, the lifecycle part has not been covered yet enough in the conference, and this is why this workshop is made, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not revealing too much, right? No, no, no. They, they set, set it up. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So API lifecycle is an extremely important part of the uh, of the governance and the uh, the the, uh, the life cycle actually <laughs> of the APIs inside the company. I even wrote a book about continuous API management that I advised like fortune. One one thousand about API life cycle, and it's an extremely important topic, and I'm really glad that you are here to explain it to to, uh, to the audience. So please, uh, a warm welcome for Brian and for John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for making it to, to the very end. I know everybody's kind of brains are full and everything, but we'll try and make it uh, exciting for you guys and uh, you know a little bit enlightening as well. Talk about some of the stuff that maybe we haven't really talked about today uh, so far. So. Scalable API design and life cycle for the future. Well, I really loved the theme of this event because if we're talking about the future API stack, I don't know how we can talk about that without talking about the full API management life cycle. So this, to me, the stack needs to support not just uh, some of the things you might be thinking of as API management, but it's some more things as well, right? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what does that mean uh, for, for the future of, 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 the, of the API stack. Um, we're the Axway Catalyst, so if you guys haven't heard of us, um, my name is Brian Otten, I work uh, with the team. John Weiss is here as well from the Catalyst team. And uh, you'll find us all over the globe. We're, we're speaking at events like this. Uh, you can see what we're up to at the, uh, at the website there. Um, and we're really all about digital transformation, helping optimize those customer experiences so uh, you know, organizations can go through digital transformation. Uh, we can knock down any barriers. We can help you with strategy, right? We can look at uh, your API strategy in the context of digital transformation, right? Um, we can, we can you know, help you uh, sell it internally. We can help you uh, forge the, the right relationships and really talk about what it means to have a successful uh, strategy to deliver digital transformation. All right, so who's excited? Let's let's build an API. Everybody excited? Come on, come on, let's do it. All right, whoa there. Wait a minute, why are you guys getting so excited? What, what are we building, right, and why? So doesn't this, doesn't this represent what you probably experienced as an API initiative? Um, I know that I've seen it a million times, right? Everyone gets all excited about APIs, and then nobody stops to think about what are we doing, right? We're gonna go off and build APIs. I've seen it, uh, you know, customers think that API strategy is all about just doing a bunch of public APIs. We're gonna have a really slick developer portal. We're gonna put stuff out there, and then everyone's gonna come and consume our APIs. It's all about us producing APIs, right? It's not, right? It's not about that. It's not about, oh, well, we're gonna open up our systems to, you know, uh, to the outside world and we're gonna do integration and we're gonna expose all of our data. Not strictly about that either, right? APIs are about consumption. APIs are about making digital transformation real and it's about making it uh, real for your partners and it's about growing your business, right? So you have to stop and think about what is it that we're actually trying to achieve I've heard today a couple of times that API strategy is business, needs to be business centric, right? One of the first things that was said this morning uh, in the keynote, you know, it's gotta be led by the business, right? And we all, I think, accept that, right? Um, does anybody not accept that API strategy has to be business led and business, business centric? Anybody wanna be brave and refute that? Okay, so would you think that the business needs to be involved? In that? Absolutely yes, right? And yet we're all technologists, and how many times have we complained and said, well, we can't get access to the people in the business that we need, right? We, you know, they're not telling us what they need, right? And then on the business side, the business people are saying, well, you know, we've told them what we need and they're not building the right thing, okay? You know, so you have this friction between the people who are doing the digital strategy, who are coming up with the digital products. They're coming up with the new innovation, but the innovation's not happening because the technology people are just not able to move quick, quick enough. Right? 
So it helps to take a few steps back before you just go into launching in and building, right? Because everybody was ready to build, right? When I said, yeah, let's build an API, everyone's like, yeah, let's do it. But take a few steps back, right? In your organization, are you thinking about what is the value of the API, right? Are you, as an API provider, thinking about how your APIs are gonna make people's lives easier, right? Are they gonna relieve pains? Do you know what the pain points are? Do you know what the gains are? Why are we doing APIs? What is that gonna do? What is that gonna create? Do we know how to design it, right? Based on whether we think we're gonna relieve some pains, create some value, create some capabilities. Do we know how we're gonna test this thing? And do we know how we're gonna do this quickly so that we can iterate? We're not gonna go away for six months and do our APIs and then make them available like I explained in the beginning and then you, you whip off the, the, the sculpture, you know, the, the cape and it's like, here are our brand new shiny APIs, but now we realize that that wasn't what was required so we gotta you know, go through that whole thing again. So it's all about what is your value proposition for your API as a provider? But I, I would argue also that as a provider, you have to think about your consumers. You gotta get into the mind of who's consuming your API, right? You gotta think like a product manager. How many people have heard the phrase API as a product? How many people would be able to offer a great definition of API as a product? Right, it's, everyone goes, yeah, yeah, API is a product, it's a great, great thing to do. But what does that actually mean? Well, if you think about it in terms of the value proposition of your API, then you can think like a product manager. I get this all the time, say, okay, well, we're not ready to do this in our organization. I mean, we, don't, we don't have product managers, right? We, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you have project managers or not, you have people who think like project managers, and those are the people that you have to co-opt and start to think like product managers, right? You also have to think like a software developer because the job of technology is to make it feasible, right? So it's no good if your consumers say, well, we want this, we want this, we want the moon on a stick, and that's gonna be my product. But as technologists, we have to say, well, wait a minute, how are we gonna secure that, right? How are we gonna make that scalable? Uh, we don't have the data, we don't have access to the data. We don't have all these things. So thinking like a software developer and a technologist is also important, right? So you have to think like somebody who's using your API, right? Now there's some great ways to do this, and there are great ways for you to start collaborating with those people who are thinking like product managers, your business partners, right? People who uh, think that they're just coders and you know I don't really get to talk to those people, that's gotta change, okay? It makes it very, very difficult if, if you cannot collaborate with the people who are actually knowing what the value is and are driving the digital transformation and the digital products. So, um, at Axway, we, as the Catalyst, um, do, are delivering sets of workshops that we call Accelerate, and part of that is teaching people how to do it. So it's one thing to come up with the theory and one thing to talk about all these great, you know, uh, highfalutin ideas, but how do you actually get started? What are some of the practices? How can we start thinking about API as API operations, right? We've already made the jump to DevOps because we realized that if you're looking at development and operations in silos, it makes it very difficult to be agile. So part of the agile revolution is resulted in DevOps. Well, what about business operating with technology through business operations people and API operations, right? So you're thinking about these in terms of the pipelines that have to be supported by, by the API stack, okay? So one of the, one of the things that I love is the, the API value proposition canvas. It's a great way to get people together, people who are thinking about the product together as business people and technologists and just starting to, to whiteboard it. I mean, this is an approximation of a whiteboard. I can't do it. But, you know, if you imagine doing this with, uh, with a team, you can actually start to map out what the value proposition of your API is, okay? 
So you can look at what are the tasks, what are the jobs to be done, you know, what is this thing going to do? We all have internal workflows that we need to support, that we need to, that, that APIs can be a huge part of in turning those into, into digital workflows, right? Um, we've got, you know, who are the consumers going to be? What are, the, what are the pains, you know, at the moment? Is it really painful to do something like, you know, it, even, even something like passwords, you know, where a user has to maintain two separate sets of passwords for different parts of our stack? Um, you know, what, what are the gains? Are we going to save time? Are we going to, you know, cut costs? What, what, what is it that we're doing? So this is a really great way of actually mapping this stuff out, and then you have a model. You have a model that will actually inform your design um, in the next part of the life cycle, okay? So this way you can avoid the, uh, have you guys seen this before? It's the, the, the skateboard, bike, car. So this is the minimum delight, uh, uh, de delightful product. Not, not MVP, but the minimum delightful product. And if you start to map out how this is actually gonna solve problems and how it's gonna uh, relieve pains, then you can go, you can avoid the top bit where somebody says they, you know, they want a car, so you design the wheels first, then that, as your second iteration, unhappy customer, right? But in the second one, you can see how actually little value here and there as you're going along and iterating actually leads to a too much better result. Okay. Okay, the other thing, um, about the life cycle is the, the real importance of design. So we also talk about design first, okay? So doing the, the value proposition also leads to design. So it leads to uh, you know, being able to look at what's needed, building the contract, building uh, the representation that somebody can interact with really quickly. Um, it allows you to start to make use of standards, okay? Uh, you know, we talk about uh, the ability to reuse APIs. Well, when you do design first, you're actually thinking what you have already. So if you have the ability to look at your existing designs, you can then uh, reuse them much more easily. Governance is a huge thing. So how can you do governance by design? Are you thinking about that as part of your design uh, built in? And does the developer have to worry about that? Does the developer have to worry about, uh, about governance? Um, well, you can make that part of your design process. And then doing design first actually generates documentation. So you don't have to think of that as an afterthought. And I think the, the future API stack um, is, is starting to support this kind of stuff now. So you, know, you can talk to our partners at Stoplight uh, about this because we have you know, the ability for people who don't even have, know uh, open API spec to go in and create, create good designs. So thinking about the life cycle, how many, I would reckon that most of your organizations look like the top picture, right? So the current life cycle looks something like, well, you have you know, business people and product uh, people coming up with a bunch of user stories and then going through a, a pipeline where you know you're, you're doing code is passing on there are all kinds of handoffs going on uh, there's all kinds of stuff uh, happening there and then uh, you know it, it's, it's not controlled you know so there's this uh, very very little control there but uh, what we can think about is that in the future the future API stack will be supporting things like uh, people getting involved on the business side much more easily, right? So uh, using things like value proposition, and business models, and, and the spec. How many people think their life cycle kind of looks like the top? How many people are doing customer journeys and value propositions? And what, what does that mean? <laughs> trying to. Trying to, yeah. What, what are some of the blockers for that? Um, typical corporate, you know, trying to do the customer journeys and agile properly, but not quite getting it. So a mix of the two, I would say. Yeah. 
Is that because business people aren't involved or? Well, I think they're too involved. Uh, they try to run ship and steer which way tech is going and it's just, you know, it's not working well. Right, okay. Is that because they don't realize the value or? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's a good question. I'm, I'm yeah. not too sure how to answer it. Okay. Right, okay. Um, well, as I said, you know, the main thing is to simplify all this. You got, you want to reduce handovers. You want to reduce, you know, the, the amount of friction in, in the API lifecycle. And again, I, I, I have to say that I, I would predict, I'm going to make a prediction now, and you, you can help as you say, Brian, you were right, hopefully, that the, the future API stack will support some of this stuff at the beginning of the life cycle, right? At the beginning when you're trying to decide what you're trying to build before you go, go off and build it. Um, so I think the future stack is, is, you know, is gonna be all around that. We've pretty much, a lot of us have kind of looking at here where we pretty much got our DevOps pipeline, you know, known and in, in place and pretty much everyone has a strategy for that. But I think there's a huge gap in this area here where business and technology people need to work together and collaborate. I still think that's happening all over the place. So. Okay, now let's create some APIs. I'm gonna hand over to the John. Okay, so everybody should have a lab handout. And what I wanna do is I wanna continue along with the story. And I wanted to give you a bit of a hands-on rather than just lecture on some of the aspects that are very easy. Um, so let me just pop out of here real quick. Okay, so what I'd like you to do in your own environment is if you will go to uh, HP, actually it's labs dot axway, spelled with a x w a a y dot com. Okay, and I, the written instructions are on on there as well. And there's going to be a four-digit code or a lab pin. What I'd like you to type in is. 2838. And what this will do is it will spin up your own AWS instance and give you a web interface, uh, a web SSH interface. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and select start session. The hands on exercise is what you have in your hand. Okay? The four-digit code in that lab handout is different. Uh, the lab that 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 is just for an example. So, okay. So you'll notice when I typed in my four-digit lab, it gave me my own DNS entry. Okay. So each individual, when you go to run this lab, if you want to run it right now, you're welcome to run it right now. Okay. So. We have a set of uh, a, um, AWS instances running. They won't be up all the time, but they are running right now for you to participate in this exercise if you wish to, okay? But if I go ahead and I do a start session, what happens is it immediately brings up a web SSH interface. I am now in my own AWS instance, okay? And what we wanna do first is we're gonna launch as you may have seen in previous slides, um, the Amplify Builder, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and launch the standalone Amplify Builder, which is a platform that allows you that you can build your own data models, which we're gonna go through on our, in our exercise, or you can leverage uh, Stoplight or other utilities of that nature 
build your own definition and then import that into Builder. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna switch directory to my project. Okay, and then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do npm start. So we're running a local instance, but we have this DNS, okay? So you'll notice my DNS for my particular instance is right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up a new tab. And I'm gonna do port 8080, which it's highlighting right here slash console. Why that's coming up. Okay. So here is a, it is Amplify Builder. It's a standalone, it's on your local desktop. Okay, it's a uh, Node.js platform. What we're gonna do here, so within this UI, I have the ability to set specific configurations. I can, it, by default, this is set up that I can do authentication, I can set port values, okay? What I'd like you to do in this exercise is we're gonna go ahead and create a brand new model. And we're gonna mock up a an API, okay? So the very first thing is we're gonna go ahead and select model, and we're gonna go ahead and call this customers. And we're doing an in-memory connector. The other value of Builder is that I could use MongoDB connectors. There are other connectors that I can expand this platform on. But for right now, I'm just gonna go ahead and select an in-memory connector. So now I have my my data model, okay? I, I'm gonna go ahead and add fields to this. Very easy, I'm just gonna go ahead and do name, select required, okay? And then I'm gonna just add email address, the email. So the next, now that I have my, my definition, I'm gonna go ahead and just quickly set up a CRUD definition. So now I have my endpoints, okay? And I could elect to select some of them, all of them. Go ahead and save that. Restarts the instance for you immediately. Now I can immediately, now this is mocked up. I can go into customers. I could download the Swagger file directly from here. I can test it. So for right now, I'm gonna go ahead and add John. I'll do John for three weeks at axway.com. Immediately created a new record. Here's my result of my, my post. I can go to a, another method. And I can do, we'll, in this case, we'll do a get all or a find all. So I execute this, and here's my response. Okay. So now I, I've mocked up. The other benefit of this is that it's, in the previous presentation you saw that there was a, a screenshot of a, a, a definition that was uh, built and it was a, of a campsite and that had multiple models perhaps you want to make a composite API I want to go out first call I want to go out and get weather uh, and then I want to select where my camp you know it, reverse that if I want to go select my campground select my campsite now I wanna know what the weather is gonna be like for the next four days, okay? Within Builder, I can build a composite API as well. So I can make this 
very simple like we're doing here, or I have the ability to import a definition and I can do a, a constructing sequence to uh, do validation, authentication, okay? So this is just the API builder part of it. So now I have the ability to, and here's just the debug logs. From here, I have the ability to, I can, actually from here, I should say, okay? I can go ahead and stop builder. Okay, so now builder stop. I do have the ability within this package, I can create a Docker container. So now I have my container built. I have the, with my in-memory model, I have my valid data validations within my, uh, for my API, okay? I have now a container available. I can go to OpenShift. I can launch my container there. I can go to AWS and do Kubernetes and, and launch my container there. I can use uh, Axway's platform. Within Axway platform, we have a utility called Runtime Services. So I have the ability to you know, launch my container within Axway's Runtime Service. So now this is my backend resource. Okay. Along with the platform, so now I have it. I would have it running within my runtime service, but I want to put security and governance around it. Okay, right now this is just the equivalent to an app server, you know, but this is a cloud based. Within the Axway Amplify platform, I have the ability to do central, okay, and central is. The, I can build an API proxy within Amplify Central. As soon as it comes up. I can, I can import my swagger from my runtime service, from OpenShift, wherever I have my container running. I can import that swagger and now I can put governance around it. I mean, hopefully this will, come on. There we go. So now I have the ability to register an API. I can, in this case, I think I have a local file, so let me go ahead and do that. Just so you can see. Here, we'll do that. So this is an example from, I built the environment in Builder. I created a container, I launched it into runtime services, and now I've gone ahead and created an API proxy within Central. I have the ability, it shows me the definition of my API, okay? So now I have my proxy created. From here, I have the ability to launch it within a test runtime. And this runtime is actually running in central, okay? 
So if I'm doing my life cycle management, I would go from a development environment to a test environment to a production environment. Okay, So I can go ahead and deploy that configuration and I now have a specific URL to get to that instance. Okay, I can add it to my catalog. So now it's discoverable. Here's my catalog, okay? I can go into my catalog and I can subscribe to it. Uh, so here's my definitions, okay? But what I'm trying to show you here is the ease of the life cycle management, but I've done it rather, I've done it in the flow of API first, okay? I built my definition first, and then I'm utilizing the tools necessary to expand and you know, enforce governance, enforce security. Anybody have any questions? Then we have an opportunity to go through the lab. So the part, the second part with the runtime services and the central, uh, that is not in the lab. That was the second part of it where you would have to, you can sign up for an Axway platform ID and that would give you access to uh, some of these tools. And, and some of them are, are just open for trial purposes, okay? Is there any questions I can help answer for anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you show us the step you deploy the, uh, uh, the, the cupping region file? So, when you, there's a couple ways to do it, okay? I did not go through the, the, the actual part, but so on the last step here, it tells you how to create the container, okay? That's the definition. You do the definition go to container and then you can so I have the configuration of my, I, so I have a swagger file, so I have the definition, okay? But what I've done is that I've rolled the, the when I built my model and builder, when I went to here, okay? You see how right now I was I, I built a, a data model within <coughs> memory, and I'm doing some, I'm, I'm testing my endpoints, <coughs> okay? Right now, I'm just working within the Amplify Builder utility. If I want to now move this to a, a managed platform, like OpenShift or Kubernetes or, uh, or, or Axway uh, Runtime Services, okay, I can deploy that container to one of those endpoints. So your configure file is in memory local on your machine, right? And it goes to the cloud to, to deploy? Correct. So if I wanted to use Axway Runtime Services, for example, from here, okay, I have a, I can build a container and I know that this is going to fail because of an AMI error, but I can run a Docker build current directory, and then I want to label it, and I can do my project, and colon, version, whatever version, okay? So this command, because I have a builder uh, standalone installed local on my laptop, okay? I would be able to build a, a Docker image. Now, once I have that image, I can deploy that image to wherever. And because I'm using an in-memory connector, when I deploy that image, the data that, when, when I ran that post and when I ran that get, the, all that data was just stored in memory, okay? So when I deploy that container, I'm gonna use an in-memory uh, mo uh, model. So that data is not stored in a, in a physical database, if you will. Now I could, 
in Builder utilize a database connector. I could use MongoDB and I could tell Builder, hey, how do I get to MongoDB, okay? And then when I build my container, that container will have the instructions of how do I get to my MongoDB endpoint. Does that answer your question? Yes, that makes sense. Okay, so the one last thing, you had another question of it, I didn't deploy it, okay? Right now, I can build my container. With utilizing the Axway CLI for runtime services, from the command line, I can do publish command, and it will publish to Axway's runtime service. So you haven't stopped work yet. So that was, okay, so runtime service, think of it as your backend server, okay? Central, think of it as your API proxy. That's where I'm doing my governance, okay? And that's where I, I have it listed in my catalog for discovery, okay? Any other questions? I can, yeah, go ahead. So this is deployed in the node Node.js? This is on a Node.js platform. Yes. Builder is a Node.js platform. Does it support other platforms also, like any applications like Tomcat server? So I can expand it and I can put it on uh, Python. I can build yeah. other services. I do have the ability to expand from like using SDK and stuff. So uh, all I did is that I just mocked up, I, I have a definition, yeah. my API definition, and then I mocked up a server, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm mocking up endpoints. And then I built a container with those endpoints solely for testing purposes. I could build a container with real endpoints if I chose to. But in this exercise, it was solely for, so, it, the configuration files. So right now I have, I created a project called my project. Okay. The steps that I didn't do for you would have been this. I would have done API builder. Init. And then my project name. So I'm going to call it Tom. Okay, so now I've created a brand new app called Dom. And then I can go into, let's see. What this will do is this will download, the reason that things are pre-configured is that we have a specific version of Builder installed and a project already created. If I create a brand new project, and then I go in and I do the NPM install, it will download a newer version of Builder. Okay. And that's the way to assure that the, the lab worked uh, in, in the flow that it was intended. Some things were already pre-installed for you. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. sure. Thanks. You had another question? Does this have any uh, option to have write the business logic on top of connecting to the database and then have some business logic implemented in there? So there is a flow methodology in the builder. Let me see if I can do something. Oh, I turned it off. So in builder, you do have the ability to import your, your definition, okay? And then you can, within each endpoint, you can build a flow. And, and that's where I was describing the, the concept of a composite API, where I may, you know, I may do a get on, let's say, campgrounds. 
but that get is also triggering other endpoints to collect more data. I want to know the weather. I want to know, you know, various information. So I can create a composite API. Okay. Does support different scripting languages to implement those logics? So ideally, what you, you can in Builder, you can use JavaScript and you can build data validation logic. Okay, but ideally what you would want to use is a tool like Stoplight and build your definition in that and add your data validation. Perhaps you might want to do a regex for uh, Latin longitude, okay? Or there might be a, a, a state field where it's only a two character field and you want to make sure that somebody doesn't add four characters. So you would put that type of logic in your definition. You can put you you can do it in stoplight, okay, uh, and, and you can expand your data validation, or you could go in the builder, and you would, could write the JavaScript in validation. So what I wanted to highlight here was mostly focused on life cycle management, okay? It wasn't so much about central or build or anything like that. What, what I was leveraging is Axeway's components to show. So what I did is that I built an API in Builder. So I defined what my API looks like, okay? And then I created a, a container and I, de I deployed that to, in, in my case, into uh, runtime services. Now I have a formal backend, okay? So what I've done now is that I created an API proxy in Central. And with that API proxy, I am enforcing governance. I'm enforcing security. I'm making it discoverable in the catalog. So basically, the real offering from Axway is the API governance and lifecycle management, not the backend. But the runtime service is just an add-on if you want to run services in Axway. So Correct. I, I could have launched that container in OpenShift if I wanted to. Okay. Um, it, it's wherever your your. It, it's just that I was trying. I, I was simplifying. I'm not necessarily sure, but the real thing is that the API calls would still pass through the Axway platform. Yes. Yeah. So they would go through central as your front end, and that's where your governance is. And, and then upon success of that, then it is proxied back to your back end engine. And then on the platform, you could implement security, Absolutely. whatever you need. Absolutely. So, what are some of the scaling numbers? Because for external API, the, the requirements might be. So I'm of the belief of an API is an API. It's all defined by who's the consumer. I, I, I've interacted with many clients that, well, I have public APIs and I have private APIs. The design phase of an API is the same. It's a matter of who's the consumer so you can wrap the correct security model around it. And you may have introduced quota uh, if you're doing monetization. Um, Central is a service. Yeah. So, so technically, if I am wanting to have private or internal, I, I know you don't like the word, but like, you know. No, it's fine. I understand what you're saying. Like communication, 
that having central of mighty put me uh, but increase the response time like an overhead of going through the internet instead of like just well the so in, in a previous discussion you you may have seen where hip or, or, or hybrid is most common okay clients don't have a hundred percent in the cloud or a hundred percent on-prem so there are so we have a solution that matches that hybrid methodology. Perhaps I want some of it in the cloud, okay? And I can have an on-prem solution. We it actually has a, an API gateway as well that I can release on-prem, and I can have my catalog, and then I have the ability to do mesh mesh uh, governance. So I can put an agent on the local, and I can manage it all from one interface. Does that help answer? Yeah. Okay, great. Anybody else? Well, I appreciate everybody coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.